Thank you so much, Lynn, and <clears throat> thank you all for the interest that you have in better patient care and better evidence-based care. Um, a small clarification. I actually went to debunk this field because of my own skepticism. And it has been suggested back at NIH that I stayed too long. <laughs> but I did find the limitations of reductionist medicine. And in my opinion, the National Institutes of Health is a superb institution, probably the best or among the best we have at reductionist science. And frankly, if reductionist science would solve the issues, would resolve the challenges, probably we would not be here. Change generally comes from below. The National Institutes of Health deservedly sits at the pinnacle of America's biomedical science. If you expect NIH to wake up and think differently than they have, for the last 54 years, it's unlikely to happen. And in my particular case, the moment of awareness came because running the clinical laboratories at the clinical center and not knowing what the laboratory values were for healthy people, we knew what the values were for statistically usual people but we didn't know what the values were for lab tests for healthy people. So I proposed that the National Institutes of Health establish the national reference ranges for all laboratory tests on healthy people. But of course, in order to not exsanguinate them, we would do micro methods. The micro methods were developed successfully and then we suggested that we would like to test people as opposed to other animals. And for the first time in my scientific career, my proposal was turned down. So I revised it and sent it back in, and it came back very firmly rejected. So I went to the then director of NIH, Don Fredrickson, and asked how to get it approved. And he said, well, which part of the N and the O of no do you not understand? And I said, no, Don, in my career, no is always a chance to clarify, to get better, to revise, to improve. I've done everything I was asked to do, and I got a firmer rejection. He says, go read the enabling legislation. There is actually legislation that enabled the creation of the National Institutes of Health. It was about 1947, 48, 49, it was around that time frame. And if you read it, it says that the burden of human suffering is so great that NIH shall, to the exclusion of all else, study disease. So it does. And so it is. And so we're here. Fast forward a bit, if you will. Fast forward with me to the time when my daughter, who is now 25, was a premature baby in the neonatal intensive care unit, and they were drawing adult volumes of blood for checking bilirubin. And I wanted them to know what my daughter's bilirubin level was, but I noticed that they were likely to make her anemic. And so I pointed out they were taking adult volumes of blood, and they said, yes, they do that, and the children routinely get anemic, and they transfuse them. And I pointed out that I was an NIH certified blood banker and that no elective transfusion was safe. No elective transfusion was safe. I mean 100%. They checked and found that I was, in fact, a certified blood banker from the National Institutes of Health and that, in fact, no elective transfusion is absolutely, positively 100% safe. Every few years we learn something that's in there that we don't like and therefore we test for that to make sure it's not there, but that's the way it is. So I called the laboratory at the hospital and I said, there's a micro method for bilirubin. And they said, yes, we know, it's the method of Jaffe. I said, this is Jaffe. <laughs> they didn't believe me. So the head of the laboratory called me and said, Russ, is this you? And I said, yes, and it's my daughter. Now, the laboratory allowed me to set up the micro method overnight. Do you know why I set it up overnight? I only had one daughter, and I was highly interested. <laughs> However, the neonatologist pointed out that they had a committee through which all changes in laboratory procedure had to go. So they would continue to draw adult volumes of blood on my daughter, but in the future they would probably use the micro method. 
So then we checked further and found that there was a doctor from Japan who had developed a camera and you could take a picture with a special filter of the forehead of the baby and not draw any blood and get a better bilirubin method. And Dr. Itsaro Yamanuchi happened to be in Washington, D.C. giving a meeting and was willing to make a house call on the baby in the hospital. And the hospital was willing to accept the donation of the camera, but pointed out that they had a committee and it would be at least several months before they could possibly approve its use on anyone like my daughter. So I do have a personal interest, but we should get back to depenicillamine and toxic metal detoxification, its mechanisms and clinical use. We will be looking together at the pharmacokinetics, at the therapeutic use, and at provocative test protocols. For any of you who uh, I've not yet been introduced to, I do have first training in internal medicine and clinical pathology, double boards there, a PhD in biochemistry and physiology. I'm a certified clinical nutritionist, a member of the National Academy for Clinical Biochemistry. And I'm a member of four or five different societies of which I maintain fellow status, and what that shows you is that I'm easily bored. Our research is done through the Health Studies Collegium. I do direct PERC, a medical nutritionals for physicians and health professionals company, and I do direct ELISAC Biotechnologies, which does lymphocyte response assays uh, for delayed food and chemical hypersensitivities and delayed allergies. What brings us together is the fact that by a rather large coincidence, my doctorate in biochemistry is on the mechanism of penicillamine action. So it's something I've had a long, if you will, love affair with. And we're going to look together at how depenicillamine or depen works, what its pharmacokinetics as a chelating agent are, what its therapeutic use and safer treatment. Notice I will be talking about safer treatments. I will not talk about safe treatments. Safe is an absolute word. I don't have any absolute statements. I will be talking about safer and more effective treatments. I will also be talking about the how and the why of provoked heavy metal testing using depenicillamine. And then, as a bonus, we'll look at biological detoxification, an area of our interest, and how to more safely use agents like depenicillamine uh, in addition to, not in replacement of, biological detoxification. So how does penicillamine work? 